Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Antonina Kolokova, and uh, um, I'm substituting for Sandy and Venkat, who are usually introducing the workshops from Simon's Institute, but uh, they uh, they're away today. So um, just to tell you about the Simons, for those who are not familiar with Simons, they are leading international venue for collaborative research in theoretical computer science, as you might have noticed. Established in 2012 with a general grant from Simons Foundation, the Institute brings together world leading researchers in theoretical computer science and related fields, as well as the next generation of outstanding young scholars. Um, the primary aim of our program is to explore the use of algorithmic thinking in science and engineering and to study the laws of computation itself. So now uh, I'd like to welcome you to the workshop on proof complexity and mathematics, the second workshop in the meta complexity program. And uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for their work in putting together a great program. So this is uh, Edith Samaret, uh, Rahul Santanam tomorrow, and uh, Tony Pitasi. So thank you so much. Well, um, thank you. And uh, a few logistics for the coming week. Uh, so food outside uh, for the before the first talk and during breaks. Uh, for lunch, um, you're on your own, but there is a ton of uh, places within walking distance. Uh, find somebody and follow them to the food. Uh, they ask us to leave food outside the auditorium. Uh, food and uh, drink outside the auditorium. And uh, if you need to leave your stuff somewhere, there, there are lockers on the far side of the building on the first floor. Oh, so if you're going for lunch and you want to leave your stuff there, that's a possibility. Uh, we, our videographer, Omid, uh, will be helping speakers to set up for talks. And um, if you're here in person, just raise your hand and ask questions. Speaker is okay. And uh, remote participants, uh, I can ask in Q and A on webinar. Uh, can be made panelists and speak up. Again, we'll figure it out. And um, uh, finally, thank you very much for Elizabeth and Ashley from the Simon's Events for managing all the logistics. Uh, including the accommodation for out of town visitors. So now I'll uh, give this to Ido, who actually started the workshop. Thank you so much. Ido. Thank you, Antonina. Uh, so uh, yeah, welcome everyone. I I'm happy to see you. Uh, soon uh, we'll have uh, um, more people, I guess. So uh, the, I think we have a great, uh, exciting uh, program for this workshop of complexity and meta mathematics. Um, we have uh, um, uh, bounded arithmetic here. We have uh, dedicated days for each uh, theme. So we have uh, the first day is going to be really straight proof complexity, straight into the technicalities. Uh, we have been here for a couple of uh, months, actually, and we've done a lot of uh, introductions. So there will be no tutorials. We decided to have this very straightforward. Hopefully, you can catch up or already understand the material. Uh, so as I said, very, very exciting, I think, talks. First day, proof complexity. The second day, bounded arithmetic. Let me say about this. Uh, so bounded arithmetic has uh, quite uh, exciting times these days. Uh, there's a lot of work from different kind of communities participating in this uh, uh, established area. And we've been running uh, reading groups about this and there's a lot of interest from different perspectives. So this is another thing that is exciting um, about the area these days. Uh, third day is connections with algebraic complexity. Also, I think it is quite an exciting uh, 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 direction in proof complexity, connected need to 
um, as algebraic circuit complexity, and we have quite a lot of people from this area. The third A will be SAP and applications, which is also an exciting area within proof complexity and application. Now, let me also tell you that um, we are quite fortunate because we are here in meta complexity program, and we have a lot of people from structural complexity, meta complexity, and complexity joining us and interested in of course, in proof complexity and bounded arithmetic, but also uh, we are lucky because we have in parallel the uh, SAT reunion, which is also the usual crowd of proof complexity, plus uh, people interested in SAT and applications. So we have a lot of people from diverse uh, backgrounds here. Uh, the, the last day is going to be uh, um, uh, talks uh, about learning, and also bounded arithmetic and different uh, uh, and different um, uh, areas. Um, right, we'll also have uh, one day for open problem session. Um, and I think I've already told you that today we're going to start with Russell, R Russell with, a, <laughs> with a very, uh, I think a very interesting uh, work that he's done. Uh, with uh, Tony and uh, Mauli Sasank, and it's going to be straight into the lower bounds. Thank you, Russell. Hi. Um, so, uh, as Ido mentioned, there are going to be some like actual technical details in this talk. Um, you know, it's a bit early in the morning. Uh, but I think it's good to like, before we dive into the technical details, remind ourselves why proof complexity is so important. Um, so as you know, proof complexity will be invented in the 23rd century by Captain Kirk. Um, and the problem it was meant to address is defeating androids. <laughs> Androids, as you know, are creatures of pure logic and so cannot resist a logic puzzle, but have to use automated reasoning to solve them. So the only way to defeat an Android is through a combination of logic puzzles and illogic. They will, the Androids will be helpless the, the longer you can get them working on these puzzles the longer the time you have to resolve the situation without them interfering. <laughs> so here's a typical logic puzzle that was suggested as a way of defeating um, uh, androids by McCarthy paradoxically three and a half centuries earlier. Okay. Uh, it's called the mutilated chessboard puzzle. Okay. You remove the two corners of a puzzle. Can you tile it with two by one dominoes? And it's actually been proved by people in our community that any resolution-based method is gonna require exponential size uh, proofs to, uh, to show that this, is, this is problem is, is not possible to solve. But a human can use reasoning, saying each domino covers a, a white tile and a red tile, yellow tile and red tile in my picture. And there's actually removed there were the same number, but we moved two yellow tiles. And so there's no way of matching up the remaining red tiles and yellow tiles. So accounting our, you know, humans can use counting arguments that defeat androids. So like, how long will this puzzle stun an android? And I have to tell you some bad news that's gonna cause us to, totally rethink the foundations of our area. Not at all long. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask ChatGPT to tell you about the mutilated chessboard problem, ChatGPT is happy to help you, um, to explain it to you. Although in kind of vague terms, like an undergraduate would use. Uh, <laughs> okay. But then you say, well, how about a seven by seven chessboard? 
And ChatGBT says, well, of course you can cover a seven by seven chessboard with the corners removed with, because then there are 47 tiles squared left, <laughs> rounded down to 23. <laughs> <laughs> and so with 23 dominoes, we can. Uh, and so what, why we have to rethink the area is the androids are here. <laughs> and their logic is making my head explode. <laughs> they learned the Kirk maneuver and they're applying it against us. We have to do something. Okay. So, um, okay. So, uh, anyway, uh, I don't solve this problem. I leave it as an open problem for you to work on. <laughs> okay. So, um, what I'm going to do is like try to defeat traditional androids rather than the current traditional fictional androids rather than the current real androids <laughs> um, that are soon to be in your um, telling you being your complete boss, by the way, you know, they're going to be in your search engine, they're going to be in your mail programs, they're going to be telling you how you should write your papers. Um, Okay, that off my chest. <laughs> the, the intuition is that uh, proof systems usually have lines that are some kind of restricted form of circuit. If we can understand, and so they have to reason about concepts that are formalizable, that are expressible with this kind of line, with this kind of circuit. So, if we can prove a limitation on the type of circuits that we allow as lines in a proof, we should be able to prove lower bounds on, uh, on all SAT algorithms, all proofs using this, and hence all SAT algorithms whose reasoning is expressible within the system. So, uh, of course, to put this intuition into, you know, to actually use this intuition to prove lower bounds, we would need to have some circuit lower bounds. And we don't have very many, at least uh, for in, in the non-monotone setting. So, um, you know, CNFs are pretty easy to prove lower bounds for. Uh, I don't know who first proved a lower bound for a CNF. I don't know whether they even bothered to take credit, but we can use the kind of weakness of CNFs to prove uh, resolution lower bounds uh, starting with Hawken and going on, maybe not even starting with Hawken because there were like uh, Sutton had uh, regular resolution lower bounds earlier. So um, okay, so and then uh, AC zero lower bounds uh, by uh, I tie first X zipser and so on were translated into AC0 Frege lower bounds. Actually, I should have put Itai also as a reference for this. He was the first, uh, but then uh, the, the latest in the, I think it was still the last in the sequence is uh, Beam. Uh, that's wrong. Okay. <laughs> no C. Uh, uh, myself. Uh, actually, yeah, there should be two P's is the problem. Yeah. I don't know what I was thinking. Okay. Uh, yes, Tony, are you going to list the authors for me? No, no, I'm going to tell you, Hasta is always the last one. Hasta is always the last one. Oh, you want to put a Hasta at the end here, too? Yeah, okay, good. And Hasta is the last one. And then you go on to like, what other class of circuits do we have strong lower bounds for? It's AC0 with mod P gates for P of prime. And technically, we sort of have lower bounds when it's a uh, composite, but those aren't real. Those aren't really very concrete. Okay. So uh, the AC0 mod P lower bounds of Rasborov and Splensky should give us AC0 mod P Frege lower bounds uh, due to no one yet. <laughs> Maybe Captain Kirk will solve it. Okay, or Spock. What? Yeah, okay. We could put in monotone circuit lower bounds and then we'd be more optimistic, but 
Uh, but we don't even have, we also don't have, I mean, we have like limited use of monotone circuit lower bounds to prove. We do have use of monotone circuit bounds to prove um, uh, proof complexity bounds. But I don't know that we have like a general, I don't know what a proof system where every line is monotone would be. It's as strong as Prega. It's as strong as Prega? For monotone. For monotone, okay. So, uh, so it'd be good <laughs> to translate um, monotone for lower bounds into monotone Prega to lower bounds too, since that would actually give a general Prega lower bound. Yeah. Well, are there any results that are now able to, like, you can sort of in a black box way transfer some AC0 function lower bound to a AC0 trigger, or is it always proved just like this? Yeah, so, well, so if we had a generic way of translating lower bounds to proof complexity lower bounds, we could actually do it because we have those circuit lower bounds. And as of today, unless someone in the audience is going to search out Eureka. Actually, yesterday I did this. Um, uh, we don't have um, AC0 mod P for the lower bounds. Super polynomial, or even like a, a strong polynomial, a large polynomial. It's pretty, it's pretty disappointing. And it's not because we haven't been trying. Um, so uh, we've been trying just to translate the particular circuit lower bounds into uh, into uh, uh, into proof complexity lower bounds for at least about thirty years, uh, and the approach that we came up with thirty years ago um, is to, uh, you know, it's kind of natural to take the proof that Ross Brough and Swansky came up with and say, what's the proof complexity analog of the proof technique they used? And what they did was they took all the circuits of that form and approximated them by polynomials mod P. Okay, let's look at proof systems where the lines are polynomials mod P and use that as a stepping stone to prove what we really want, which is AC0 mod P Frego lower bounds. So we looked at proof systems like Mel Stolen's up and later polynomial calculus that uh, were strongly motivated as attempts to, to try to prove AC0 mod P lower bounds. And those proof systems, the good news is those proof systems uh, Oh, so let me just define the one of the proof systems. That's the, the only one we're going to actually talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about today is a polynomial calculus later expen, ex, extended, I think, by Rosbroff to PCR. So I'm going to give the PCR version. So you have uh, you represent the constraints as polynomials over a field uh, where the you know, the inputs are either variables or represent either Boolean variables or their negations. And by a polynomial as a line, you're really thinking of the equation is equal to zero. And you add in the equations, X plus its complement should be one, one or the other should be true, but not both at the same time. Their product should be zero. And then your rules are just the usual rules in kind of algebra. You're you got two equations, you can add them, multiply through by constants, multiply through by variables, and keep on adding. And we can measure a couple of different complexity measures. Uh, you know, like the natural one is the size, the total number of non-zero terms that appear in the proof. But we can also look at uh, related measures like maximum degree. Okay. And the good news is we were successfully able to prove, you know, and we as a community were successfully able to prove very strong lower bounds for uh, a wide variety of tautologies. Uh, you, we usually like prove them in two steps. We prove a strong degree lower bound and then show that a strong enough degree lower bound translates into an exponential size lower bound. There's a generic connection. And the, uh, so this, this shows the limits 
of using certain algorithms based on modular reasoning, uh, algebraic reasoning to solve uh, CMF set. So, um, so that's the good news. <coughs> the bad news is we're, after doing all that, it doesn't look like we're any closer to proving lower bounds for AC zero much. And the gap is there's, there's like a couple of gaps in different approaches that you could try to reduce AC zero mod P to algebraic proofs. One is you could say, well, let's look at algebraic proofs that only approximate, you know, maintain, have only approximate validity. The problem is that as a, Roman Smolensky showed me in like 1991, uh, such a proof can prove any tautology. <laughs> you can just approximate the tautology with one, <laughs> you know, or just as a linear combination, and that's approximately true. Okay. So, uh, so in fact, in 1991, I was like trying to convince. Roman to work on the stones as proofs, and he said he convinced me to drop it <laughs> um, because it couldn't help solve AC zero mod P. Fortunately, other people continued. <laughs> okay, so uh, so in the the other thing that's kind of bad. Uh, okay, another approach would be to add extension variables. But when we look at even extension variables, adding small tweaks to our variables, we realize that the lower bounds that we proved are really brittle. And they break when you make any kind of modification to the, to the input. So for example, if we look at sign graph tautologies, and they say, give it, you have like a graph G, the variables are edges, so it codes an edge-induced subgraph. In the tautology is that that edge into subgraph can't have exactly one odd degree vertex. The number of, of odd degree vertices in an undirected graph has to be even. So, um, okay. And this is hard when G is a sparse expander, you get a linear degree lower bound, uh, except for mod two. Reasoning mod two is really easy. You just like sum everything up mod two and everything cancels except and, and you get zero equals one. Uh, but any other prime, any odd prime, you can prove a, an exponential lower bound on the size of any uh, algebraic proof if you use the original variables. But if you do a change of variables, and you define a new variable to, to say it's negative one if the edge is there and one if the edge is not there. Um, then the parity, the thing that was so hard to reason about, the parity of edges in the in the cut becomes just a product of variables. And you just mimic the proof mod two using products of variables, and it all works out, and it's uh, you know a small polynomial size. I mean, like quadratic size because you have n lines and each one has a linear number. So, uh, so this, these previous, you know, it's not the degree that changed. We did a linear transformation, didn't touch degree, but once we deal with one minus one variables rather than zero one variables, there's no size, there's no generic size degree. So that was the state of the art uh, even a few years ago, I guess like in 2019. So we needed to come up with size lower bounds for, you know, how do you reason about even like variables that take on one minus one or some other values instead of zero one? Uh, and we want to do this uh, for, you know, we want to work to AC zero mod P lower bound. So we want to work mod P. Um, and P shouldn't be two because then changes the variables mod two. There are no non-Boolean variables. Okay. So uh, 
come up with size lower bounds that allow these kind of changes of variables or maybe introduction of simple extension variables. Uh, if you could even like, if we could do this, take this to the limit and um, have uh, multiple rounds of introduced extension variables that each one depends on the previous round variables. Each one allows us to go a little deeper into the circuit to find gates further up in the circuit. And so this would have uh, implications for, this would allow us to prove lower bound phrases zero mod P, uh, but a number of works have shown that it actually would also prove lower bounds for a lot of other proof systems that go well beyond AC zero mod P. So it's a big step to go to have these uh, rounds of extension variables. So, uh, so this is kind of like the, the challenges in, in order of complexity. And uh, in 2020, the first challenge was met. Not by us, but by Sokolov. Uh, Sokolov uh, showed a new technique for proving size lower bounds for one minus one value variables. Um, and it, it's also a way of, of uh, taking degree lower bounds to size lower bounds, but in an indirect way that doesn't apply to every pathology. So, uh, so you have to have uh, a degree lower bound that's very robust in that the restriction, lots of restrictions of the original pathology are also have a, a degree lower bound. Um, so, and, but his, his, you know, so his lower bound seemed very, he was dealing with like one minus one valued variables and a lot of steps in his lower bound were uh, particular to, um, to one minus one variables. I should say there, there are also a, a number of works and they're including one that Ido mentioned to me last night that I didn't have time to add to the slide. Uh, to, that uh, look at lower bounds over polynomial calculus with extension or even stronger systems like the ideal proof system over the, uh, over the rationals or other characteristic zero fields or very large characteristic fields. Um, so uh, uh, the reason why I don't just claim that this is like the victory for the area is that also the, 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 the tautologies they're looking at often involve uh, things that don't make sense mod, mod primes, like uh, subset sums uh, where they're not translations of CNS. I think that's the main, the main gap. But you know, you could like remind me the, uh, the new paper that you have that I should add to the list. Just um, like um, a, a, a subsequent work to Andrews, Andrews and Paul, it's a, it's a constant depth. Uh, I think so uh, for simple, some, uh, some restriction on the polynomial. This was your, it's not uh, CNN. Yeah. This was your Fox paper last time. Okay, with uh, Thomas Akwinyemi and the uh, National. Thanks. So, uh, so, okay, so we're gonna like make at least some partial progress towards resolving the situation, mod P for translations of CNFs. Um, so here we're gonna consider um, proofs augmented with just, unfortunately just one round of extension variables. We don't have like multiple rounds uh, and they have to be K local meaning each new variable can depend in a kind of arbitrary way, but on K uh, of the original variable. So it's certainly strong enough to do like any kind of reasonable change of variables, but not necessarily uh, strong enough to uh, express really complicated things, global properties. So, um, and then once you, uh, define these new variables using some equation that defines them, 
then you have a normal PCR reputation, uh, except you, you don't get the, like, there isn't anything like the negation of the Z, ZI because they not, may not have Boolean values. Okay. So what we show is uh, we give a family of CNF tautologies where any moderate number, you can add any moderate number of uh, extension variables and still get a almost exponential lower bound. So there are two ranges where you can have like a trade-off between how local, how many extension variables you're allowed to add, uh, how local they are, and the size lower bound you get. Uh, if you want to maximize the size lower bound, you we you know make the size lower bound the most impressive, you get the high end result. Whereas if you have like a constant local uh, extension variables and just like n times poly log n of them, then uh, you get a size lower bound that's that exponential in n over poly log n. So almost like that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can have uh, n to the one plus alpha extension variables. So more than linear, but less than quadratic, uh, each order log n local and you'll get a lower bound that's exponential and n to some power, so we see that. Yeah, that. <clears throat> Beyond these uh, uh, parameters, there are no, it doesn't work. Well, there's a trade-off between the two, between the three parameters. No, so there will be no uh, super polynomial lower bound beyond the uh, okay. beta so, log n local extensions. I'm not sure about that. Um, we might be able to go somewhat above beta log n uh, uh, using similar techniques. Uh, I, I'm not going to claim that we have. That part, I think, is, is probably the easiest to improve. Uh, the harder thing to improve is to go beyond quadratically many extension variables. And what about the, uh, the restriction of the locality, local extensions, such that they cannot use previous variable, previous extension variable? Yeah. Uh, If you have like everything sufficiently local, you could probably just unravel that. So like if you have Z that depends on, uh, you know, so Z depends on W and uh, W and W prime and W and W prime depend on two input variables each, then Z implicitly just depends on four input variables. So you could probably, if it's sufficiently local, you could probably claim to view multiple rounds, <laughs> but it's not actually very impressive. Um, and it would still just be like a fixed number of rounds because the, you know, it's growing exponentially. So, um, so are there any other questions about what what we're doing? So we're our proof uh, has, is pretty complicated. Has a lot of moving parts that have to be done in the right order, but it basically follows Sokolov's lead uh, pretty strongly, but. It isn't sometimes not clear how to follow that lead. And we tried a lot of different, you know, translating different, uh, uh, different parts of his ideas. Uh, we tried a lot of different versions <laughs> until we finally got some that, that worked. Okay. So, uh, okay. So first thing that, that we can do that, that does kind of work is um, in proofs. So Sokolov said first step, the proofs involve one minus one variables. That means d squared equals one. That means we can just replace, you know, we don't have to have uh, any, any higher powers than one. 
we can just combine the z squared terms with the constant terms and the z cubed terms with the, the linear terms and make everything multilinear in these variables, every line number of uh, If we're looking at gen general extension variables mod p, well, they don't make, they don't necessarily satisfy z squared equals one, but they're going to satisfy some equation like zk equals c. Fermat's little theorem says uh, z to the p minus one is going to be congruent to one as long as z is non zero. Uh, so uh, my p minus one is an upper bound on the k. There might be smaller values of k. Depending on exactly which set of values z can take. So we can always like assume everything is constant degree in these z's. So when we, after we do this, uh, so Sokolov uh, used this saying like, how close are we to small degree? Uh, And he used this notion of quadratic degree, which is approximately the maximum degree, not of a line of the proof, but of the square of a, the line, squares of lines of proofs. Seems like a strange thing to do. So first we would try, well, okay, maybe we should raise the, to the k power, to the p minus first power, uh, but that doesn't give you much <laughs> uh, directly. So say, so, well, why did he do this? And uh, we came up with this idea that I'm now calling factor degree. I don't think we've used this term in the paper. Uh, but I think we still call it quadratic degree in the paper. <laughs> um, but uh, that didn't make sense. So I'm calling it the factor degree. So factor degree of a polynomial, if you can write P as a single monomial M times a low degree Q, the degree of Q is the factor degree of P. And it's equivalent to saying, uh, oh, okay. So how, how does this relate to quadratic degree? Well, if we're in my, one minus one variables, the square of any monomial is one. So if P is M times Q, then P squared is just gonna be Q squared. If Q is low degree, that means the the degree of the square of the lines are low degree. So, uh, so that's, so small factor degree implies small quadratic degree in the one minus one. Factor. Um, and uh, it's also true that if you've got a proof where every line has small factor degree, you can translate this into a proof that's just small degree. Uh, the, you know, it's step-by-step -step simulation. Uh, and I spelled it out. Uh, let's do. Uh, Ten minutes. So I think I'm going to skip this. <laughs> but you can. So, so now we want to like use as our measure how close are we to having small factor degree? And so, uh, what prevents us from having small factor degree? Well, if m one and m two appear in the same line, and m one is really different from m two, has a lot of variables that have different exponents uh, in m one than they do in m two. There's no way to factor out anything in common. So. Um, so we say that they're a factor degree D violating pair if they're Hamming distance in terms of a vector where we would write down the, for, every, for every variable, the exponent of that variable in the, in the monomial is large, is larger than D. And they have to appear in the same line of a proof. One thing that we had to like figure out at some point is we just want to look at the set of violating pairs for the proof. We don't want to count them, say, you know, even if this violating pair appears in a million lines, we're only counting it once. Um, so, uh, 
and each pair has, you know, by definition, has many different degree variables that are kind of responsible for it. So we're going to look for is like we when we like go from uh, size to degree for zero one variables, we're going to look for a variable that appears, in, you know, in many terms. Here we're going to look for a variable that appears differently in many pairs of terms. So, uh, okay. So again, here's another idea that was in Sokolow's paper that we had to struggle to adapt. So if Z is a one minus one variable that, and we've eliminated anything except this defining, you know, except the axiom Z squared equals one. So we sort of eliminated the variables that it kind of depends on or, or relates to. We can, uh, we write each line as Q times Z plus R where Q and R are polynomials in the other variables. And uh, Sokolov observed that we can split the proof into the Q part and the R part. So write down Q and R as separate lines. Okay. And, uh, and like everything, the axioms don't involve Z. Uh, so they're just R's already. Uh, when we sum, we sum pointwise the Q's and the R's. When we multiply by a non-Z variable, we multiply the Q by that variable and the R by that variable. When we multiply by Z, that just switches the role of Q and R. The R becomes the Q, the Q becomes the R. So if we're keeping both, we have already have both. So we can follow, we can just do the proof step-by-step step, keeping both the Q and the R. And this split removes all the violating pairs where Z had a different exponent. So if Z has a lot, it's in a lot of violating pairs, that removes a lot of the violating pairs. Okay, well, this doesn't- What was the uh, unsatisfied axiom condition? What is unsatisfied axioms? Uh, okay, so- um, uh, each, uh, each so, so at this point, so there's a part I'm slurring over. So. If Z, if we have like something like Z1 times plus Z2 equals one, then the, the, the R part would be Z2 equals, equals one and the Q part would be one. Okay. So, uh, so we, we can't even get a start. Okay. So um, going to the Q and the R, if we have a, a, um, a axiom about, uh, that involves the, um, in the original tautology, uh, we can't even get a start in this proof. So we first, Sokolov, you know, and this is also following Sokolov's lead, we first have to uh, satisfy that, say, well, we'll promise that Z prime, we're just gonna plug in Z prime equals Z, Z minus one, and that's gonna satisfy that axiom and that axiom disappears. And now we've got uh, no further axioms involving Z, then we can do the split. So, uh, so we're gonna, yeah. So we're gonna like uh, do these rounds where we identify a variable, extension variable that we wanna split on, say, uh, sort of remove, look at all the variables it depends on, satisfy all the conditions that they could be of all the axioms that those variables are, are, depend, are involved in, make those variables kind of disappear from the proof, and then we can split on zero. So this means that we have to start with a very robust tautology where we can just set a bunch of, we can satisfy a bunch of axioms uh, and not make the tautology trivial. Uh, but so I was going to talk about that at the end, uh, but um, you <laughs> sweeping things under the rug. So, but say that um, say that variable could take one and two. Okay, well then we know z squared minus three z plus two equals zero. It's no longer the case. Like if we multiply q z plus r by z, you know we're going to get something but it's not gonna just be switching the Q and the, the R. 
it's going to be like the new Q is going to be three Q plus R and the new R is minus two Q. And the problem is that, you know, we could split these, but we haven't removed any, any things that like uh, any term violating terms, one in R and one in Q are still there in the three Q plus R part. So the splitting works, but it doesn't actually reduce the number of violating. So we have to try it something a little bit more subtle. So say that we're down to like Z having two possible values, A and B, and we're gonna to have to like set things to make this the case. Um, so then, and we write every um, polynomial in the, in the group is up to like some polynomial in Z with the different parts. And so the, the violating terms involving Z are gonna be like having one term in one of the PIs and the other term in the in a PJ. So we're gonna like pick a, P, a pick, pick your I and J where a lot of the violating terms about Z are in PI versus PJ. And we wanna split that doesn't have any of those violating terms in the same in the same part as each other. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna interpret, since Z has only two values, any two powers of Z are enough information to interpolate any polynomial about Z on those two values. So we can write each line as some polynomial times Z to the I plus some other polynomial times Z to the J where these are gonna be linear combinations of the piece. So um, I'm not saying that we can like prove that this is true, but it, it is going to be the case. And then we split, we're gonna have the, like before, we're gonna have a proof where the lines are all the QIs and all the QJs one at a time. And the point is that see, the <laughs> QI is the factor of Z to the I. PI appears all to, in, in the QI. There's nothing left to appear in the, the QJ. And for vice versa. PJ won't occur in QI. In the and so when we look at the proof that just has the QIs and the QJs, it's gonna be more complicated than the original proof possibly, but it won't have as many violating pairs. Um, okay, so when we do this, this is where uh, we say like, if we've got M uh, extension variables, we, there's always gonna be one, and we like use B, the degree as our limit for what, what the difference is. Each violating pair has Z variables that occur differently in it. So by averaging, there's at least, uh, there's a Z, an I and a J, where we can get by splitting on Z with respect to I and J, we can get rid of a D over M times P squared fraction of all violating pairs. And this is pretty good if this is like bigger than like one in N, but it's bad if this is less than one in N, which is where the quadratic limitation goes. goes. So, so capital M in the bottom of the slide is different from the top, right? Oh, oh, okay, yeah, that should probably be a lowercase m on the bottom. So it's lowercase the number, m is... is the number of extension variables. Oh, okay. Sorry, these are particular monomials. Okay, so uh, I said that the last ingredient um, is that we need to be able to like get rid of all, when we identify a variable, we need to be able to get rid of all the axioms that appears in. Uh, to do this, we need these very robust, high degree, robustly high degree topologies um, that even after we restrict, they're going to have high degree. And our uh, robust high degree tautology involves taking a, a CNF, a kind of random CNF, uh, 
for constant k. And that's going to have um, every variable appearing like in constantly many clauses. And the clauses are constant size. And any constant fraction of the clauses are unsatisfiable. So we can like get, say, uh, let's restrict down to a subset. You know, if we're in a certain axiom, it's, all the axioms are kind of expendable. Say, oh, that, you, you caught me on this one. I don't care about that one. I didn't, all I promised was like 90% of these axioms are true. I didn't promise that that one was true. So uh, to formalize that, we're going to introduce variables y1 through y sub cn that say which, which of the clauses are actually true. Uh, and so uh, make sure they're different so that there are enough of them. And then uh, say that if, each clause that's specified by a Y has to actually be true. So um, what uh, I think the main open problems that we leave, and there, you know, with just still a small step to what we want, uh, which is lower bounds for AC zero mod P Frega, is to, um, to go beyond this M equals N squared barrier, uh, that's also true, like in all of the size degree trade offs. If the, you know, even for zero one variables, we don't really know how to get good size lower bounds if the degree is less than square root of n. And um, prove lower bounds for much larger localities and prove lower bounds for much larger localities with multiple rounds of extension variables, which would, um, which would really could you know, would bring us very, if not to AC zero mod P Frega, very, very close. Any questions to Russell? Yeah, Antonin. So uh, to which proof system does it generalize? Uh, you mentioned that you uh, have those results not just for PCR. Sorry. So right now we just have it for PCR. Okay. I hope I didn't say we. No, I, mean, I hope I did not overpromise. Yeah, over finance. Over finance. So in your proof sketch, you had two variable, uh, uh, two valued variables. Yeah. Is there some other uh, generalization? You know, how does it generalize? You know, like, what, what is, yeah. is there some other idea that's needed to extend that to um, other so variables, other more valued variables? We, we did need to extend it to more value. So we, we didn't really try because, uh, we didn't really need to extend it to, to multiple value variables because what we did was uh, we sort of like picked, we said it depends on K variables. We were able to like remove the axioms about K minus one of those variables. Um, mm. And so the, the two variable, the two value case was what's left. So once I it see depends yeah. on one Boolean variable, it's just the variable that's left out. So projecting from all the others, you that's just get right. two values left from that Boolean that's right. moving to some other pair. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, um, so we could we didn't really think about multiple values, but it also isn't clear how much that would that would inform us. Question. Last question. Yeah. Uh, let me just ask: uh, uh, um, What is the strength of this proof system um, with extension, local extension? So how do you know that it's even improves on the previous one? Well, okay. So one thing that that's kind of true uh, is that you can, you know, so you can like say uh, in this proof system, you can easily prove like science ontologies also like sign typologies mod Q for different values of Q, depending on the P that you started with. Just by having, uh, and I don't think, I don't think like, uh, uh, 
that there's any that there's any like proof system where we have lower bounds where that's consistent. Yes. But you can prove uh, simultaneously all the mod mod q and a growing number of mod q. Thank you. So let's uh, thank uh, Russell again. Good. Good. Oh, there was one 